Yeah, g'day and welcome back to my lathe channel. I've been working on modernizing this fantastic early 1980s Schaublin 125 CNC lathe. As you can see, I've populated my board now to try and keep track of all the different projects I'm working on. And this week, this is what I'd like to get done in this video. Guess we'll see how much of it actually happens. As I mentioned last week, my last major wiring job is to wire up the D-sub 25 pin connector to control my pneumatic valve terminal. So let's get into it. Did you guys see that on November 1st, SpaceX is going to be launching their awesome Falcon Heavy rocket again? Cool. After the last time I did a cable, some of you said I should put heat shrink on each individual wire. So this time I did. Boy, it sure makes it take longer. While I'm still doing wiring, last week I found and fixed a short in this junction box. Well, I fixed the short, I didn't really fix the cause of the short, which were the leads of a couple of capacitors being exposed. So let's insulate them. Okay, so this is what we were talking about, and I managed to get the leads to touch. Everyone said I need to insulate these leads better, and yeah, I agree with you. You know, I think I'm going to extend these with a bit of wire on each leg, because that way I'll be able to get proper heat shrink over them. Turn up the end of one. It's really not that easy to solder three things together like this. So I just bound the areas to be soldered together with a single strand of wire. I threw a bit of heat shrink over the end more just for mechanical support than anything. Hopefully, no more shorts. That's the first job done. I've now connected the other end of this cable coming out of the pneumatic module into my I.O. card. Next thing I can cross off the list. Now, unfortunately, because I'm running two different rails, this one at 24 volt, but this one at only 5 volt, I've used up all of my output pins now. I do have a couple of 24 volt pins unused on this board, the 7i83, which is used for analog control of the drivers and motors. I can use those remaining three. Unfortunately, I'm gonna need more, more 24 volt output pins than that. I'll probably have to add an extra relay board and then trigger things off my remaining five volt outputs. What I've got here is a watch list on the six output pins I've tied in. And I just wanna try them out, make sure that they actually work. So pin 10, we'll set it high, which is to 1. Yep. Okay, so those six pins are working fine. Right, I've now bodged up an air supply into here. Let's try the simple one first. The C is just on off. Just try it with, with Linux CNC. That's working. What about the one next to it? Hmm. I think that's got a sticky valve. It's been controlled, but the valve's obviously not moving. That's a shame. Well, if that one's not working, this is currently unused. So if I connect up, maybe I can do the same job with this one. I played a bit more with this uh, valve module. Just as an update, the L is a complete divider. So this basically breaks it into two completely separate systems. I'm gonna have lubricated air coming through all these services and dry air just on this side because that has to go to the collet closer. Festo offers a bunch of different configurations for these end plates. On this lubricated oil side I'm going to have one inlet, one exhaust and an internal pilot air supply. So this is connected to this internally. Whereas this left hand side I've currently got has got two different inlets, one exhaust plus the pilot air supplies external. So that would mean I'd need to split the air into three different supplies just to get this thing to work, which of course at the moment it doesn't. These are my two spare end plates, a left and a right. This is a complete blanking plate, this one. And this one is probably the same as my current left hand with two separate inlets plus an additional pilot valve. Now flipping them, now we can see that a left hand and a right hand 
are not interchangeable. This one's got an alignment pin and all the sealing. This one doesn't. But you can see what Vesto does. It appears to be one single casting and then they just machine them differently. This one has connected ports between the two inlets. So you could just blank one. This one doesn't. I took another look in the catalogue and while this L plate completely separates both sides, a T plate only separates the main muscle ear. It keeps the pilot ear connected. So I'm thinking if I remove this L plate and just put in another valve as a, as a placeholder, I can still have my two different air supplies, but I can take the pilot ear just in from this side. While I've got it open, I'll have a look and maybe I can just mill across the bottom of this one. So then I can also remove one of the inlet pipes. Looking at this left hand side plate you can see that the two inlet ports are not joined. But if I remove a bit of metal from these two, that'll do it. And then I can block up one of the in inlets. Just remove those two fittings before I get any, any swarf or gunge in them. Shit, should have taken the seal off first. Well, that seal almost survived. It's just ended up missing a piece up here. This is one I definitely don't need. This one's seal also looks in better condition. Now I'll just trim it. Well, those mods worked. I've now gone through and tested it all, and I've got all of the valves that I need to work are working. There's two spare positions. Now let's set up and test the first system, the collet closer. Oh, oh, mail time. Phil from Phoenix reached out to me because he's been doing a set of these uh, precision ground stones on his uh, on a surface grinder, and he asked me if I'd like a set. It's like, wow, that's really cool. Thanks a lot. Phil's YouTube channel is called Almost Machining. Have a look up the top here for a link. Oh, so a nice little small uh, sharpening stone as well. And he also threw in a couple of pieces of carbide for making scrapers. Thanks very much, Phil. I'm sure you all have seen these precision ground stones on channels like Rob Renzetti. I think he got them started. They're so precisely ground that if you use them on a, on a surface which is already flat, they'll just glide over the surface, not wearing down the surface, but if there's any little tiny micro scratches and stuff which have knocked up little burrs, then they'll whack those down. You can really feel it just glides over here, doesn't grip at all. So there we have it. Before you use them each time, you just, give, you just clean them up by running them on each other. So there you have it. Thanks very much, Phil. I really appreciate it. That's awesome. I'll get a lot of good use out of those.
When I got these tool holders, I don't have any collets for them, and they take ER25. I've only got ER32 and ER16. Now I could have just bought some ER25 collets, but you know, I was on eBay, as you are. While I already have ER32s, there are a few sizes which you'll always need multiples of. 6, 8, 10, 12, 16, 20s. But the main reason the auction caught my eye, this time both ER32 and some more ER25. This is the one for rigid tapping, so it's locked in rotation, and once it gets to its full feed depth, it just disengages. I figured it would be good to have extras of these. You'll probably keep a couple of these set up with the standard things you always need, like a center drill. And these things don't come up for sale very often, so I figured better grab that set while I could get them. I got one tool holder, which takes this directly. Okay, but it doesn't actually work on this rear tool post, which is the only thing I've got set up at the moment. Big shout out to my Patreons. Thanks for your kind support, it allowed me to buy this. The other packet came in from China. I think I know what this is. Yeah, because I blew up one of my drivers, I bought another one. But in the meantime, I fixed the original. And it seems to be working. Much of the control stuff they do with a CNC machine is pretty simple. You put in an end switch, move to the end switch, stop. We can also add more complicated functions like don't release the collet closer if the spindle's turning. Because we don't want our work to fall out of the collet. The complexity increases to something like this automatic tool changer, which is going to have, I don't know, five sensors and three control valves to control the pneumatics to raise, rotate, and then lock the uh, carousel. The complexity can, of course, increase far beyond this to even like a whole lights out factory where everything's coordinated and working together, multiple machines, parts loaders, tool loaders, tool measurement, all of that stuff. Well, simple functions can be achieved through relays and cascades of them. They take up a lot of space and there's a lot of wiring and it just becomes difficult really fast. Now you can't get away from relays completely because at the end of the day, something's got to switch the muscle power to control a unit. But you can move the logic to control the final relays from relays into a computer. Luckily, Linux CNC offers a number of really good solutions for this. Now, at one level, there's the so-called hardware abstraction layer, the HAL file. This is like the virtual wiring between the physical machine in and outputs and the software. You use the net command to connect a pin to a signal, or a signal back to a pin. But wait, there's more. The next five callers get the opportunity to add logic to their HAL. You can add like AND or 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 NAND, NOR, all those sort of uh, logic commands. A simple use of this is like an inhibit. So only release the collets if I push the collet release and the spindle's not turning. Now the ultimate way of doing this is to use components written in C. This is the way a friend of mine programmed the gearbox for the Bajo. An alternative way of doing this often used in industry is to offload this to a programmable logic controller or PLC. One common way to program PLCs is to use ladder logic programming like here. Luckily the same functionality is offered within Linux CNC. This is something I've been really looking forward to learning and luckily the Feral engineers put out a fantastic set of instructional videos covering all of the basic aspects of using it. First I assumed my collet released foot switch was a momentary switch, so I made a latching circuit in classic ladder, but then the foot switch didn't work. At the moment neither of my switches, neither e-stop nor collet release, are working. So let's have a look at them. Let's get down here over the back, in the coolant bay. Okay, I can see the first problem already. The e-stop switch looks broken. It's falling apart. There's a bit of it here, and it's not making contact. Whereas this, looks like they've bolted a whole big foot switch up against the wall. But 
The external foot switch is just not moving far enough and I probably need to adjust the, the stop a bit. That looks easy. So I learned to do a latching circuit in Linux CNC's classic ladder program because I expected here this just to be a momentary switch, but check this out. On, off, on, off. So obviously there's a mechanical latching in the actual switch module. That's why it's such a big module on the inside wall here. While adjusting the collet closer switch was easy, this is my e-stop switch and it's broken. Definitely lost some part out of the guts of this uh, switch. So there's a broken plastic bit here, a spring, probably a push rod or something's missing. I think I'll just replace it. I've wired that in. On, off, that works. I'm not getting any change in the state in Classic Ladder. Here I've got collet dash foot and there I've got collet underscore foot. That might be sticking out a bit much. Right, the last thing to check is my spindle inhibit. The spindle inhibit is off, which allows the signal through. If I start the spindle, it's inhibited. Well, once again, much less done than expected. Some of these items, I'm waiting for spare parts to arrive. If you like this video and you watched it when it first came out, straight afterwards, I'm gonna be doing a live stream for the Patreons and members. Did you see Dan Gelbert's uh, latest video, just came out this week, where he shows his way of inspecting machine tools? Well, I figured I'd check the Schaublim in accordance with his procedure. If you're interested, I'd appreciate your support on Patreon. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.